Okay. I want to go ahead and start the meeting. Hello, everybody. Um, it still feels strange to talk into a, an iPad rather than to see all your faces. Um, I want to welcome everyone to Appalachia Audubon's March program meeting. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Donna Laguerre, president of Appalachia Audubon Society. And I, I do want to comment on what a beautiful day it was today. I was very excited to get one inch of rain. My rain gauge told me it was one inch. And then to have it followed by this. Let me see. Are, are, Dara, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, OK. All right. I, you, I thought you just sent me a message. Okay, um, and then to have it followed by such a beautiful day and I was watching yellow sulfur butterfly on, on uh, woodland flocks and uh, the wild azaleas, the pink ones are in full bloom and the plum trees are blooming. So it was very exciting. Um, <clears throat> before I turn the meeting over to the board member, Peter Gorin, who will introduce our speaker, I have a few announcements. Our next program meeting will be Thursday, April 15th from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, our speaker is Nicole Jackson. She's an environmental educator and one of the co-organizers of Black Birders Week. Her main goal is to help people of color find access to local resources that connect them to fun natural experiences and become environmental stewards. So I'm really looking forward to um, seeing this, um, this program. It will be posted on our website probably tomorrow. It's not up there yet, but um, probably tomorrow it'll be up. We also have a special field trip arranged by board member Peter Kelly. It's a tour of the Deep Roots Meat Farm in Greenville, Florida, Saturday, May 15th from 10 till noon. Um, this farm is really doing a great job at producing grass-fed beef for people while protecting upland and wetland forests. Um, we'd really like you to sign up for this program before March 31st. And I, I wanna emphasize that this is a program for Appalachia Audubon Society. Um, so really um, it's not open to the whole public. So it, it's, a, it's a nice opportunity for um, our members to get out there to, to see this place. But he would like, um, like you to sign up by March 31st. So go to the website to sign, for the sign up information and definitely bring your binoculars. It's a, it's a nice looking car with birds. Um, we also received a small National Audubon Society grant that has enabled us to fund an intern from FAMU. Her name is Sierra Nelson. She's an environmental policy major and she's going to be working with us this semester. And then again, next year, both uh, fall and spring semester. And she's teamed up with our FSU Sustainability Fellow, Sarah Calzada. And Sarah was the one that um, implemented the Bat House at Lake Alberta. And with a WFSU high school intern named Chloe Reese. And they've planned and coordinated a cleanup event at Lake Alberta on Saturday, March 27th from 10 till noon. So if you wanna help, uh, there's a sign up information on our website, go to appalachie.org. And if you haven't been out to Lake Alberta Park lately, be sure to get out there right now. Um, the, the Purple Martins uh, have taken over the gourds, they're nesting um, and they're, they're giving their uh, melodious chattering. Um, and it is really rewarding to see the fruits of our labor out there. Uh, the wildflowers are sprouting up, wood ducks are starting to nest, bluebirds are nesting, martins chattering. So all of our work there is paying off. So with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Peter Gorin to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Donna. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Mark Tanzik. Mark is the Commercial and Residential Horticultural Extension Agent for the University of Florida IFAS Leon County Extension Office right here in, on the Paul Russell Road in Tallahassee. Since 2016, Mark has been sharing research-based best practices for sustainable landscape management with green industry professionals and residential homeowners. He also coordinates the Leon County Master Gardener Volunteer Program, of which I'm a member. 
Originally from Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, excuse me, Mark moved to Tallahassee in 2003, where he lives with his wife, two kids, dogs, a flock of chickens, and a herd of worms. Uh, prior to joining UF IFAS, Mark worked for the Leon County Public Works Department for six years and the Growth and Environmental Management Department for three years. His first job in Tallahassee was a field biologist with the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Mark is a proud 2002 uh, graduate of the University of Florida where he got his bachelor's degree in botany. And he's currently working on his master's degree in soil and water science at UF. Tonight, Mark will be reviewing many of the natural communities of Leon County, their indicator species, and the public areas where these natural communities can be observed. Mark, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Audubon, for the invitation. And I'm going to try to stay on time. We'll see what happens here. All right, there it is. Okay. Well, folks, this is Know the Forest by the Trees. And again, Peter just introduced you. Um, isn't this a beautiful photograph here? This was, uh, I got to play around in Camel Lake near Apalachicola National Forest a couple of weeks ago. And this is a beautiful example of wet flatwoods, which we're not really going to cover today as I go through the Leon County's natural communities, but it's a just a beautiful, beautiful shot. And throughout this presentation, I'll probably say how amazing we are to live in a place that is just so blessed with all these natural communities that we can visit within a you know 20 minute drive oftentimes. So we're really lucky. Uh, I did want to tease Audubon a little bit for that big, my big face on the flyer. Uh, and this is, you know, my, my professional uh, extension uh, headshot here uh, and some of the, the uh, you know, my previous work experience that Peter mentioned, you know, I got to play, uh, you know, here's no one cared what I look like, right, just go collect data out in the woods. Again, it was, uh, I did a lot of work as a field biologist for Florida Natural Areas Inventory, amazing job. Uh, and then here is my work with Leon County. Uh, this is doing a lake vegetation index survey on Lake Hall, I believe. Uh, so uh, my background is botany. When I talk about these natural communities and indicator species, I'm going to be really focusing on plants. And so I'm sure there's lots of folks that will, you know, could come talk to you all about animals and you know, some of these other, you know, things you'll find here. So uh, he introduced me. Uh, here's my contact information. I'll have this up at the end for questions, but hopefully you all have been to the Leon County Extension Office. We're at 615 Paul Russell Road, right next to the fairgrounds. Uh, and come on by and check out the beautiful gardens maintained by the Master Gardener volunteers. And here's some of our social media type stuff. I, I know we're on Instagram and I think even Twitter now. So you know, check us out on all the, all the social stuff. You know, a little spiel for here for IFAS Extension. Uh, again, hopefully you all are familiar with this. Uh, you know, for over 100 years, we've been around and providing information to improve the lives of those in our communities. And one thing that sets Extension apart from a lot of other places you can find information is that we are all based in research, right? So, uh, you know, my job is to convey horticulture information to folks, and it's all got to be based in science. Uh, you can see here on the right, here's our various facilities. Um, every county in the state of Florida has an extension office because we are a partnership with our local county. So, you know, here Leon County and IFAS work together to provide extension services. As the horticulture agent, I focus a lot on Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, which if you don't know what that is, go Google it and uh, check that out. But there's these nine principles uh, that kind of try to help Floridians maintain a beautiful landscape while protecting Florida's unique natural resources. And this talk, you know, focusing on native ecosystems, native plants, it goes in line with our very first principle, which is right plant, right place. So the epitome of right plant, right place is native plants. And so, you know, I like to have people think about what was your home, right? What was your lawn, your property? What was that back when everything was natural, back before we came and, you know, converted to agriculture and then, uh, you know, subdivisions. 
and try to see if you can go find some of those places and incorporate some of the plants that you like into your own uh, landscape. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to define indicator species, which is a little bit of back and forth on what is an indicator species, but we're going to define indicator species. We're going to go over natural communities, um, the definition of natural communities. We're going to review some of the common and unique natural communities uh, that you can find here in Leon County. And then we're going to talk about where you can go to observe these, these beautiful uh, natural entities, these natural collections of plants. And there is a beautiful pond pine uh, from the National Forest. So uh, anyway, we, I love uh, pines and all the plants. So I need to just uh, keep moving here because I got a lot of slides for you. So indicator species, uh, the United Nations Environmental Program uh, back in 96 kind of came up with this definition, right? That a, a species whose status provides information on the overall condition, they reflect the quality. And right, so, you know, you think of an indicator, sometimes folks will think of a, like a, a bio indicator where, you know, the presence, the condition of a particular species gives you an idea of the health of an ecosystem. And that is kind of one, uh, ecologist kind of like one way to define indicator species. Uh, there's also this concept of a foundation species. And so this is one that you know, this is a species that defines the structure of a community by creating various conditions for all the other species that are present in that ecosystem. And here's some of you, you know, you want to dig into this a little bit more. There's some uh, references. And by the way, I will share this with uh, Audubon, this presentation. And so if you all want to share this around to folks that signed up, uh, feel free. But I kind of use it as, uh, you know, the term indicator, you know, here's the definition of indicator, and I kind of use it as this guide or index to kind of tell you what kind of category of ecosystem you're in. So us humans, we like to put everything in little boxes and give them names, and the natural world, you know, doesn't really easily fit into these, you know, convenient boxes for us. But what as a field biologist and as a ecologist with Florida Natural Area Inventory, you know, what I what I was taught to do was go out, walk around, you know, these, these assemblages of plants, you know, we had to define them into some name, some, uh, and I'll go over Florida Natural Areas Inventory and their Natural Communities Guide here in a moment, but we have to define them and put them in a box. And so what we do is we use the, the kind of the suite of species that are present uh, to help us do that. So I'm going to be using this more guide index kind of feature of indicator to, to help with this. And again, what my job was, was to go out and make maps that look a lot like this. So uh, on the right is Babcock Ranch, or um, that's down by Fort Myers area. And I got to walk across big, huge chunks of this property. And we go out there with aerial photos. Uh, we take lots of data points and we draw on our maps. We get back to the office, you know, we kind of put all that information together, all these data points. And it's really helpful information for the land managers to see, you know, how many acres of basin marsh versus hydrocamic. Uh, this particular Babcock Ranch has a lot of dry prairie. Uh, and so you Audubon folks, there was um, the meadowlarks. I remember the meadowlarks there were amazing. I'd be walking through these dry prairies and the meadowlarks would be doing their little thing. Uh, some of the, the most fun projects I did at FNA were more like this on the left, and these are historic natural community maps. Uh, this is a map you can actually find right online. If you just uh, do like FNA natural community map, this comes up pretty quick. Uh, this is where we would take existing data points, look at historic aerials. We would even pull out old survey notes from the 1800s, and that was really, really fun for me, kind of a history nerd as well. So. Uh, then we would put all that together and we would create the for the land managers, you know, here's what you have and then here's what the historic communities were so they can kind of guide their management to get there. Okay, now natural communities. I'm a little biased to FNA, Florida Natural Areas Inventory, and I don't know if any FNA folks are on here, but I hope so. Um, it's a great organization. Uh, it's a great kind of asset to the state of Florida. This is kind of our natural heritage. Uh, these are the folks that kind of collect all that data, keep it together, and they are uh, just a great group of folks to work with. So uh, natural community is defined as a distinct and recurring assemblage of a population of plants, animals, fungi, microorganisms, you know, associated with each other and their physical environment. 
and they're characterized by physiognomy, physiognomy, I believe that's how you say it. It's kind of like the shape, the structure, uh, vegetation, topography, landform, you know, climate, fire. We're going to go over some of these a little bit uh, and often named for their most characteristic biological or physical feature. This guide here on the right, I found my old version and it's all kind of tore up and dirty and whatnot, but you can get this online. You just, you know, search for Flor FNA Natural Communities Guide. You can get their whole guide as a PDF, print it out for yourself, you do whatever you want to do with it. And uh, there's a lot of information there that is going to be really, um, I think you guys are really going to like it. Now, Natural community, we think of, you know, it's the ecosystem, right? So we think of ecosystems as all the plants, animals, fungi, microbes, right? And here is a kind of a schematic of a lake and, um, you know, kind of upland ecosystem. And, you know, there's our charismatic things that we can see, the birds, you know, I think there's a beaver there, maybe there's fish, we like to go fishing, there's an aquatic ecosystem, there's all the things that are growing in the soil. Uh, but a natural community is, you know, more than the living things, right? It's the biotic part of the ecosystem plus the abiotic components that kind of all have to work together. Some of these abiotic components would be like soil, so soil types. And so you can see our soil types of Florida. Uh, we're kind of in this unique little spot where we have some of these ultisols, they're called. Uh, and ultisols are kind of like older soils that have been leached, uh, lots of, you know, clay and iron oxides in them. Uh, you can see precipitation is a big part of what kind of shapes an ecosystem. And here in Tallahassee, we're kind of on the higher end of rainfall in Florida. And of course, plants, you know, love, love water. So uh, that's why we're blessed with so many plants. Hardiness zones, uh, we're in this kind of, you know, here in Tallahassee, we're in this kind of transition between a subtropical and more temperate climate. Uh, so that kind of creates some interesting, uh, you know, dynamics and a little like over overlap of different plant species. And then of course we have in Florida, especially the abiotic factor of fire, uh, which is just cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Florida is one of the lightning strike capitals of the world. I think it's kind of centered over uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, Tampa area. And so you could imagine, you know, back before roads and, you know, malls and subdivisions, uh, you know, the only thing that would kind of be a natural barrier for large extensive uh, fires caused by lightning would be our rivers. Uh, and so, you know, many of you all probably know that there is a, you know, our ecosystems in Florida are shaped by frequent low intensity fires and prescribed fires that we conduct these days are trying to uh, reintroduce uh, fire to, um, yeah, uh, fire uh, kind of excluded areas that have been kind of uh, not burned in quite some time uh, and to maintain the healthy kind of understory that uh, is native to our state, it's a natural thing. So all those together creates these natural communities that we walk through and just kind of are in awe at, right? So here is a kind of a music flatwoods type of ecosystem and this, you know, this ecosystem with longleaf pine, wiregrass, uh, part of this really huge kind of longleaf pine savanna type uh, community that is one of the most diverse uh, natural communities in North America. So there's a whole lot of plants down there. We're going to run through some of these natural communities and some of their plants, but I'm just going to give you a handful of them because it, it'd be too much. We'd be here for hours and hours and hours trying to talk about uh, a lot of them. So in our area, you know, all those abiotic and biotic factors come together to really create some unique, diverse natural communities that are just right there, real close to us. Uh, if you have not checked out these maps from the Biota of North America program, I uh, suggest you go kind of, you know, spend some time there. If you go to their main website, down on the left bottom, there is a diversity gradient maps. Uh, this is the biodiversity region map, and what you see here is that these this Apalachicola endemism zone. So this is one of our the, these biological hotspots, and it's right next door, right? We can drive, you know, say Torreya State Park, Garden of Eden, all right. We can drive over there and be there pretty quickly, and it's one of the most biodiverse areas in the entire country, right? Which is it's pretty great. 
We also have, again, we have the, the temperature, we have the precipitation. And so we have a lot of plants. And as a botanist, you know, what could be better? So here is another map from the BONAP or the Biota of North America program showing the density of plant families throughout the country. And again, you can see we're kind of in this hot spot. They have maps for every potential thing you could think of. Vines, carnivorous plants, um, oak trees. So our oak, we are a real, we're like a highlight um, of, for oak diversity as well. And, uh, you know, again, this, it's, we're, we're in a special spot. And I can't see the chat, but I see a little, a little light bulb went off in there. If you have questions, uh, I'm going to hopefully have a chance at the end to answer a question. So if you have them, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll get to them towards the end. Again, then when you look at the aerial photo of our area, you can see that we're pretty lucky because we're surrounded by all this green, right? We have the Apalachicola National Forest. We have the various um, military um, protected conservation lands kind of further over to the west. You can see the Okefenokee uh, kind of in that Florida Georgia uh, boundary. Uh, but then you can see where, you know, there's a whole lot of this kind of grayish, whitish color, you know, that's agriculture. As you go further down the state, it kind of all turns gray, especially along the coast with, you know, thick with development. Um, in addition, we have the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. We have the Big Bend Wildlife Management Area. So there's just whole lots of opportunities for us to go see intact natural communities within this biodiverse region. And then we zoom in a little bit more. And then we're in Leon County. And in Leon County, we are lucky to have, again, just you know, almost a third of the county is covered by the Apalachicola National Forest. Uh, you can see all the streams. Uh, you know, I, would, I wish we were in person and I would kind of go back and forth asking you, why do you think there are less streams uh, in the, you know, let's say Capital Circle, Crawfordville area, you know, there's a whole lot of streams all over the place, but then it gets really, it's all, there's no streams down there much anymore. And uh, anyway, we could, we'll, we'll maybe we'll bring that up later. But lots of opportunities right here for um, close encounters with these great natural communities. Okay, so let's, uh, now when we're looking at the topographic map, there's a really great, uh, document that Leon County put together, I think in the early 90s, uh, and I believe uh, Karen Keybart was part of putting this together. Uh, it's the physiographic regions of Leon County, and they divided it up into these, uh, these regions here. So the Red Hills, uh, th with this map, it kind of lines up well. It's kind of those red um, uh, high points, those, those, they call it the Seven Hills, but I don't think there's actually Seven Hill. That was just kind of something that stuck. Uh, but there's Tallahassee Red Hills, there's the Apalachicola Lowlands, so that would be your, uh, I think you can see my cursor, but it's kind of the part that's in the Apalachicola National Forest, so the southwest kind of heel or panhandle, whatever you would call that, of the county. You have your Okefenokee Dunes, which are these high points right along the Oclockney River. And there's a really cool, um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here with the Oclockney. So the Oclockney is one of the few alluvial rivers that runs through Florida, so laden with lots of sediment. And back when th this line here, this really sharp topographic break uh, between the Woodville Karst Plain and the Tallahassee Red Hills, that's the Cody Scarp. And the Oclockney River actually cut through. Uh, and this would have been almost like a bay, right? Where this, this I hope you can see my cursor because um, I'm talking like this if you can. The Okefenokee Dune here, this would have been one of the last like barrier islands when sea levels were very high, and I believe they're called Okefenokee Dunes because it's called the Okefenokee, uh, or no, that's, it's one of the terraces, I believe is, uh, there's Wicamico Terrace, I believe one of the terraces might be Okefenokee, could be around there. Woodville Cars Plain, that's the southeast corner of the uh, county, very flat, sandy, close to the aquifer, so close to, um, uh, close to the limestone uh, bedrock. You have your Lake Munson Hills and your Wakulla Sand Hills, which are kind of in this transition between the Karst Plain and the Apalachicola Lowlands. And then you have your various lowlands and basins, all your lakes. So we have our Lake Jackson, Lake Ammonia, Lake Miccosukee, Lake Lafayette. Uh, those are just called lowlands. So we're going to now kind of cross-reference these physiographic regions to some of the natural communities that you would define 
uh, using the FNA guide. So, and this is kind of the order we're going to go in as we kind of move through the slides here. You have your upland hardwood forest and your upland pine and upland mixed woodland that belong in this kind of Tallahassee Red Hills physiographic region, these kind of uh, high clay. Uh, they're still, they're not totally clay, right? It's sandy clay. So it's still mostly sand, but it's got enough clay in there to give it that color. And uh, these red oak woods are actually, this upland mixed woodland is a new community type in the FNA um, kind of descriptions uh, that I don't think was there when I started. I know Ann Johnson worked really hard to get that as a separate unique thing because it's, it's very kind of special to this part of the state. As we get into the Apalachicola lowlands, that's where we're going to see a whole lot of music flatwoods uh, in the Oki Finoki dunes. Uh, so again, those kind of high uh, ridges along the Oclockney River. Uh, we got some really beautiful upland hardwood forest. Uh, then as we get into the Woodville Karst Plain, the Munson Sandhills, the Wakulla Sandhills, that's where we're going to see a lot of sandhill, also some music flatwoods. And then in our lowlands and basins, we'll talk really quickly about sinkhole lakes and blackwater streams. So now we're going to kind of run through these and talk about what I consider their, their, the, the index type plants so that when you walk into them, you say you go on a walk and you see this collection of plants together, you can say, oh, I'm in a sand hill or I'm in a upland mixed forest or I'm in a music flatwoods. And that's where, you know, again, I'm going to focus on plants. Uh, plants can't move, so they have a really close relationship with those biotic and abiotic factors that make up an ecosystem. You know, your birds, they can fly kind of throughout, but when you go back to the, and read that guide from FNA, you'll notice that even each ecosystem has particular animals, birds uh, that are known and sometimes kind of um, almost particular to, to particular ecosystems. Okay, so let's start with upland hardwood forest. These are going to be on your sandy clays and sometimes they might be a little bit limey, so calcareous soils. Uh, fire is very rare in these ecosystems. You have lots of hardwood trees, uh, hence the hardwood forest. And those hardwood trees, it's usually pretty shady during the warm, the growing season. Um, and, you know, lots of kind of, uh, lots of leaf litter that isn't very flammable, right? So if you compare like magnolia leaves to pine needles, uh, you know, the, the flammability is quite different. And usually you're going to have a closed deciduous, sometimes you'll have a mixed deciduous and evergreen canopy. So the kind of the indicator species for this, and this is right here at the Catalactro, which is a great spot to see upland hardwood forest. The indicator species for this one, you know, this is another name this goes by is the beach magnolia climax forest. Uh, and this is considered, you know, that climax forest term is uh, when you have forest succession, this is considered kind of the, the mature forest uh, in those areas and beech and magnolia are the two where you see them together you you're in upland hardwood forest you know other things you might see there would be our flowering dogwoods which are struggling a bit but i've been walking through some upland hardwood forest and you get in some of these nice spots they're still dogwood doing pretty well uh, and then this is where you'll see your trilliums right so everyone's been running around recently i think uh, catching that trillium bloom uh, and this is where they love to be these kind of sloped forest beech magnolia, uh, and you usually will always find trillium there. Uh, some other species that you might see, so hackberry, which is on the, all the way on the top right. Uh, this one is uh, just really kind of cool because it gets this warty bark. That one's going to be found in more uh, limey type soils. Uh, you have white oak, which is, uh, let's say, top center. Uh, you know, we, Again, we have lots of oaks. Um, I'll, I can only sprinkle a couple of them in here. Horse sugar, which is a shrub on the bottom right. This is one that drives botanists nuts because it's kind of very bland and plain. And every time you're walking through the forest, you're like, oh, what's that? And you start looking into it and know it's, you know, it's just Simplocus, it's just horse sugar. Uh, but that is a, a common shrub in these upland hardwood forests. Uh, wood oats, which is this little grass all the way on the left, a very common component of the understory. And when I see them, I always think ticks and chiggers you know, but it's also kind of nice to walk through. So, you know, I guess got to deal with it. And then of course our American holly down there in the center. I didn't find a photo here for you with fruits on it, but those leaves are pretty distinct. 
So you see, you know, beach magnolia, and then, you know, you're thinking upland hardwood forest, then you start seeing some of these other species and, you know, it's a sure thing, you that's where you are. As we move to upland pine, this is kind of a, there's not a whole lot of this in Florida. There's more as you kind of uh, go north, it's, you know, kind of restricted to the panhill, panhandle because this is gonna, these are these kind of open pine savannas that are, have this a little bit of clay in the soils and they're usually on these higher um, hills, we'll call them. Uh, these have very frequent fire, fire. So one to three years is kind of the, um, uh, the kind of uh, assumed fire period for these uh, ecosystems, these natural communities. And this is kind of that classic, um, you know, back in the day the you know, folks drove their, um, their wagons through the pines, right? And uh, they could drive right through these forests. So these longleaf pine savannas of upland pine, you know, music flatwoods, um, sand hill maybe, these, it's kind of neat that these are almost considered uh, almost grasslands by some people. And I think there's a big kind of a, there's a lot of talk about considering these almost more of a grassland because you can see it's a very open, there is no closed canopy of, of trees. Um, and it's a very, very diverse herbaceous understory. And so a lot of folks are considering these almost like an, uh, almost like a little category of, of grassland, almost like your, you know, your grasslands up in the Midwest type of deal. So when we look at some of the common plants that make up an upland pine, uh, this would be uh, longleaf pine, so Pinus palustris, which is in your top right. Uh, you can find loblolly pine. Loblolly pine naturally is more of like a, a wet, uh, you know, kind of a wetter soil, but it has kind of invaded a lot of these upland pine areas, but you will find that in, in our current upland pine uh, ecosystems. Shortleaf pine is another cool one, so this is here on the lower left, that's Pinus echinata. Um, you know, most people just see pine trees and they're good at calling it pine tree, but we do have quite a, quite a few pines to, to ID here. And then wiregrass, Aristidostricta. So, you know, longleaf pine, wiregrass, uh, that's a magical mix. And uh, you know when you're in that, it's something that's gonna be maintained by fire. And when you have some, you know, upland pine is kind of just open. I don't honestly have a ton of experience walking through a lot of upland pine because you do get oaks and things kind of popping up as well but it's a whole lot of longleaf and a whole lot of wiregrass with some of these other pines maybe mixed in a little bit. Um, so there's your upland pine. Next, we're gonna move on to upland mixed woodlands, which is also known as the red oak woods. And like I said, this is kind of a unique um, kind of assemblage of plants right here in the Tallahassee area and you know up in the Georgia a little bit. These are on a more loamy type of soil. The fire interval you'll see here is this kind of wide range, two to 20 years. Uh, they kind of think these go back and forth where you might have a long time where canopies are kind of closing. And then maybe you have a fire that opens it up, but you still keep the same assemblage of plants kind of going together. Um, a little bit more closed canopy, uh, maybe less diverse understory. Um, but you, st and you see there, there's wire grass is also infrequent, which kind of leads you to that less frequent fire interval as well, because wiregrass is one of the really important plants to carry that fire across the landscape. So when you know you're in the red oak woods uh, area is you'll have southern red oak. Now that's where red oak woods comes from. So here's southern red oak right here, Quercus falcata. But the cool thing with this one, it's got hickories mixed in too. So mockernut hickory, and so this is one you'll see, you know, a lot of tall timbers managed property and actually tall timbers property is a lot of this red oak woods, that kind of Northeast part of Tallahassee. Um, mockernut hickory has probably got to be one of my favorite uh, Leon County trees. I love mockernut hickory. Uh, pignut hickory, it's close second, but I don't know, mockernut's got uh, bigger, it's got like fuzzy leaves and it seems to get a little bit more color in the fall when they're changing colors. But if you want a good native tree with fall color for Florida, your hickories are, are a good bet. So if you see southern red oak, mockernut, pignut, uh, most likely you're going to be in one of these, what would be considered a red oak wood or upland mixed woodland. Now oaks, we could go on and on and on about the oaks in these various uh, ecosystems. There again, we're kind of like a 
uh, a hot spot for oak diversity. So here's a couple more. We got Corcus stellata or post oak here. And this was the one that's got kind of that almost like a cross type of thing going on. As I know you're looking at post oak versus say a blackjack oak um, over on the lower right. And then you have Quercus volutina, which is black oak up in the top right, um, which these are, these can be confusing to me when I'm walking through the woods, especially um, the Miccosukee Greenway is a great place to see red oak woods. And you can find all of these oak trees kind of along those trails. And it can be pretty confusing. Moving into Mesic Flatwoods, uh, this is another type of community where this is now going to be on flat, right? It's called the flatwood. So these are very, you know, flat terrain, sandy substrate. Uh, the groundwater uh, table may not be too far from the surface. Uh, you have very frequent fires, you know, two to four year intervals. You can see the pines. You can see the uh, beautiful, diverse understory, lots of wire grass. Uh, so this has lots of, uh, you know, again, another open canopy with a ton of shrubs and herbs down below. Again, one of the most diverse ecosystems in North America. Uh, you also have, um, you know, again, longleaf pine, wire grass. I had to kind of keep thinking of different pictures of wire grass or longleaf pine to show you. And you might have slash pine as well. So when we're looking at longleaf versus our other pines, this I really like this picture of longleaf. <clears throat> longleaf pines have longer needles, <clears throat> hence the longleaf. They also have very large cones, as you might know, but if you don't have cones, you don't, uh, maybe you don't feel comfortable with needle length. Uh, one thing is that longleaf pines have very thick um, branches. So these branches that are holding up these leaves, you see how kind of stout that is up in the top right, uh, where this is slash pine on the lower right. And you can see how they're, they're just kind of puny compared to the longleaf pine. So that is one way to know that you are looking at a longleaf. And again, here's wire grass in the fall. So it, you can make it work like an ornamental grass as well. It's you know, quite pretty in the fall. Let's see here. I think it's trying to move. Here we go. Uh, some other really common species of the music flatwoods would be our saw palmetto. Uh, this one, again, this one works really well in the landscape. This one's really common. Most of y'all know about saw palmetto. It's got the petiole that you know, uh, will we'll saw at you. Gallberry all the way over here on the left. Gallberry you'll notice is an ilex. Uh, so this is a holly species. Um, hollies always have the little button. You can't really see it here, but that little button on the fruit, uh, that's, a, that's a sure sign of a holly. And then we have our blueberries. And this is the most kind of common blueberry you'll see in music flatwoods. Here's our Vaccinium mercenides or shiny blueberry. Uh, you can eat them and they're pretty good. They're just, you know, small and you gotta, you gotta really collect a lot. But Pretty sure the bears, you know, absolutely love some shiny blueberry in the flatwoods. And I could just go on and on and on with the flowering plants and music flatwoods, but I have to stop at some point because I was given a time limit. So here we have Leatris on the left. This is Blazing Star or Gay Feather. And this is one of the most pleasing sights you'll see in the fall as you go drive through the forest or some of our local flatwoods. Uh, they're in sand hills as well, but uh, the blazing stars are just beautiful. And then here's our sundews on the lower right. Uh, these are just one of the carnivorous plants that you may find uh, in our music flatwoods nearby, right here in Leon County. Next up, we got Sand Hill. And here is a picture of Sand Hill right at a, next to the library in Woodville. And this is uh, actually owned and managed by the county. Uh, and it's a really great, uh, example of Sand Hill and one of the plants I'm going to show you here in a minute that's endemic to Florida is pretty common in, in this area. Sand Hills, as it, you know, as the name implies, these are on deep sands. So these are going to be more in your uh, little bit of those Okie Finoki dunes, those Munson Sand Hills. So if you've been through the trails, Munson Hills, uh, you know, you're going through a whole lot of Sand Hill there. These have a very wide ranging fire interval as well, maybe five to 20 years. And you know the issue going on here with that fire interval is sometimes you have lots of areas of open sand, so you may not get um, you may not get fire to travel very well across the landscape. Uh, but you know they are dependent on fire as well to, to maintain their that kind of openness and diversity. And again, this is another open canopy um, 
ecosystem or natural community with a pretty dense shrub and herbaceous community below. Our kind of indicator species here, you know for sure you are in a sand hill when you have longleaf pine and turkey oak. So up in the top right, that's our Quercus levis. It looks a lot like red oak. And I can tell you, when, when I started Extension Office, Will Sheftall and Stan Rosenthal did a tree ID class. And the oak table, it was tables of oak trees. And everyone was just like overwhelmed with all the oaks. And the thing with the, the oak trees is if you, they're really tied to habitat. So if you can get enough feeling for what the oaks look like, but then you get an idea of where you'll find them, what kind of ecosystem they're in, kind of soil type. Uh, what kind of soil moisture do they like? Uh, it's, it becomes a, a little bit less uh, overwhelming. So turkey oaks are the ones you're going to find in really dry sands, uh, whereas those red oaks are going to be on those more clay hills, those Tallahassee red hill type settings. Uh, but if you see longleaf pine and turkey oak, you are in a sand hill. Wiregrass is another one. And again, I ran, I was like, I need a different picture of wiregrass to show them. And so lower right here, that is uh, thanks to the Nature Conservancy and Brian Pelk. He donated, uh, they had some wiregrass plugs that were maybe not quite, um, they weren't the best looking wiregrass plugs, but we weren't being picky at the time. So uh, at the extension office, we have a little longleaf pine pocket preserve we're calling and we have uh, Stan Rosenthal planted longleaf there a while back. Uh, an amazing master gardener volunteer cleared out a lot of the underbrush and we have now gone back and planted lots of um, grasses, wildflowers, and then Brian at Nature Conser Conservancy hooked us up with this uh, thousand wiregrass plugs that the master gardeners got planted a couple weeks ago. Now all the way on the left is zigzag silk grass. You know, you may not think of much when you see this plant going through the woods, but this plant, if you look at the range here on the top, this plant is only found in, I think it's six counties uh, in the whole world. This is the only place you will find Pityopsis flexuosa. And this is related to the common silk grass, which uh, I think you can buy at the landscape nurseries and put in your yard. Uh, but you'll notice with this one, this one's a little different in that it's got a zigzaggy stem. I don't know if you can quite see it in this picture. I tried to get a good one. Um, but if you see that beautiful little silk grass flower and you look closely at the, I guess that would be the peduncle or the, the stalk of the flower there, you'll see that it, it has this zigzagging going on. And that is the zigzag silk grass. Again, only found in six counties in the whole world. And Leon County is one of them. So how cool is that? Okay, we've been talking a lot about uplands. Let's cover some of these wetlands real quick. Sinkhole lakes. So a lot of our lakes are connected to, directly connected to the groundwater and to the aquifer actually. So the, you know, in Leon County, and when you look at that map, if you kind of go back and think of that map with all these um, lakes, they kind of surround the Red Hills. And these are not, you know, very common. Um, so again, we have this really unique area and most likely this is why we've, you know, this area has been settled for such a long time by Native Americans. Um, you know, I almost sometimes think of all those lakes surrounding the Red Hills as part of this reason for the maybe not so frequent fire, right? You get like a little fire shadow around all these lakes that kind of surround the Red Hills. But this here is Lake Jackson. And as many of you all probably know, Lake Jackson can look like this and then it will look like this in a matter of days. Um, this is right when I moved. Uh, I lived pretty close to Lake Jackson and right when we moved over here, uh, it went dry. And so I would kind of ride my bike down there, get pictures, watch the fishermen kind of uh, pick the, the last bits of the fish that were down in there. Uh, and we could talk, we could have a whole other lesson on aquatic plants and aquatic ecosystems, but you can see some of our American uh, lotus there, water lotus, uh, lots of water lily, of course. We have another example of a sinkhole lake that you can, it's a great canoe paddle. Uh, this is Cascade Lake or Lake Cascade, however you want to call it. This is right at the intersection of Orange Avenue and Capitol Circle Southwest. And this one, what's cool about this one is this is like a, the pH in this one is sometimes in the four, four and a half range. So very acidic, lots of tannic water, whereas Lake Jackson's kind of a, almost like a, this clastic type of lake. Uh, here's 
cascade when you can put a canoe in it. And here's cascade when the, you know, people with their big trucks think it's fun to go driving through it, right? But it's fun to go walk around uh, Lake Cascade. Uh, there's some actually some rare plants uh, found along the edges of Lake Cascade uh, in the Loraceae family. They're related to avocados and whatnot. Okay, then we have our blackwater streams. And this, I believe, I couldn't remember where I got this, but I'm pretty sure this is Fisher Creek, which is a beautiful blackwater stream. And that's the stream that flows into Leon Sinks. So if you've been to Leon Sinks, lots of sand hill over there. But when you get to the, you know, I was I kind of go in and hang a right and go to, you know, go to see the sinks first. But when you're coming back around, finishing off your loop, you see the sinking stream and that's Fisher Creek. You can see very dark water. And the thing I like to think, you know, kind of imagine is, you know, that the, the ditch along Orange Avenue, or I guess it's now the ditch that is covered up by Fam Yue. Uh, those were once beautiful blackwater streams like this. And how lovely would it be to have seen those, especially kind of leaving um, Cascade Park and all that. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Pretty good. Okay. So that may seem like a whole lot to remember, and it is. Uh, so how in the world are you ever gonna keep all this straight? It's all about practice, folks, right? So I was fortunate enough to get paid for several years to go out and walk in the woods and you know, describe what I was seeing, identify all the plants. And so I, had, I was able to get a whole lot of practice. And that's what it's gonna take to kind of absorb some of this stuff here. And the best way to get practice is to go out, explore, and observe, right? So don't just uh, don't just drive through or don't just kind of quickly go through a hike. You know, you're going to want to go slow. It's going to drive the family nuts. There's my kids right there on the right. Uh, this was me uh, having some good bonding time and a little bit of a patch of woods I've kind of adopted over by Getty Road. And we're pulling out some Ardesia there. Uh, but slow down, you know, take your time, look at leaves, just enjoy the woods and uh, pay close attention because that is the best way you're going to like start picking up on some of these things uh, and noticing what's around you. Now, where can we go? So again, I broke these up by the physiographic regions and then some of our public parks where you can go and there's a little list here, you know, little abbreviations of some of the ecosystems or natural communities you'll find there. So the Miccosukee Greenway, like I mentioned, is a great place to see these red oak woods or the upland mixed woodlands. Tom Brown Park, which, you know, people go to Tom Brown Park all the time, and I don't know how many of them understand how beautiful of upland hardwood forest there are in parts of that Cadillac Trail. Uh, you know, trilliums are blooming right where people are just cruising by on the mountain bike. So I like to take the mountain bike trails on my bike, but I'm usually going really slow and stopping. And then there's all the dudes like with their their mountain bike like jerseys on like rushing by me wondering why I'm why, why I'm stopped uh, but we also have uh, Tom Brown Park is a sinkhole lake right so you have Lake Lafayette it's been kind of butchered in the three different compartments but the upper Lake Lafayette is connected to the sinkhole and sometimes you'll see it full of water uh, there's a great little uh, there's a high point with a, a little picnic bench uh, that you can look out over the sinkhole McClay Gardens, Lake Overstreet, Forest Meadows, really great place to see more upland hardwood forest and that upland mixed woodland, those red oak woods, especially there near the soccer fields at uh, Forest Meadows. Apalachicola Lowlands, of course, you go to Apalachicola National Forest, you can spend, you can spend years exploring all the various parts of the National Forest. Uh, but if you want to see some great sand hill, music flatwoods, and blackwater stream, uh, check out Trout Pond Recreation Area right there off Spring Hill Road. Donna mentioned the uh, azaleas are blooming and I was just uh, hanging out by Fisher Creek and the azaleas are blooming right there off Spring Hill Road. You can just kind of like pull off and you'll see them blooming near the, the creek there. The Okefenokee Dunes, that's where Lake Talquin State Forest. Again, this is this little spot I've adopted off of Getty Road. There's some really, really cool stuff over there on these slopes going towards the O'Clockney River. You got Upland Mix Forest. Upland Hardwood Forest, Sand Hill, Blackwater Stream, uh, and Upland Mixed Forest. I actually didn't go through Upland Mixed Forest here, did I? But Upland Mixed Forest is kind of this um, oak pine mix. Think of Upland Hardwood Forest, but it's got a little bit of pines mixed in there as well. Woodville Karst Plain, that's where you're going to see the, the sand hills of Lake Munson Hills, the Apalachicola National Forest, the bike trail there. 
Wakulla Sand Hill. So Wakulla State Forest has got some, some pretty nice sand hill to see. Uh, Leon Sinks would be another one that I think is getting into that Wakulla or that Wakulla Sand Hills area. And then your lowlands and basins, Leon County boat ramps are a great place to go visit our local lakes. Tom Brown Park again, Lake Lafayette. And Elkirk Edwards is one that I haven't been too much, but a friend of mine surveyed that spot for FNA and he was really impressed with lots of nice music flatwoods, uh, some blackwater streams that cut through there. I believe that's kind of right next to the St. Mark's Headwaters. So that's another park I could put on here uh, to get to some of those, see some of those types of uh, natural communities. And there's a ton more, right? So uh, some of the good maps to see, uh, this is, these are available through our, our TLC GIS, which is the uh, Tallahassee Leon County GIS department. They have some really great user-friendly maps uh, where you can find all sorts of things, right? So uh, basketball hoops, uh, walking trails, whatever it might be. And here's you know some of the, the parks I mentioned. You got the Miccosukee Greenway, Tom Brown Park, uh, Elkirk Edwards, uh, Munson Hills, Trout Pond. There's Trout Pond down there in the National Forest. And the uh, Lake Taquan State Forest is another really great um, spot. There's some state and county maintained properties there. And, you know, the fact that we can be in, you know, a, a city, right? Tallahassee, it's not a huge city, but it's, you know, compared around everything we got around here, it's pretty big, right? It's a city. We can drive and in 15, 20 minutes, we can be in these just amazing natural communities. So kudos to all of our city, county, state, federal, and private land managers who keep this, you know, keep these uh, areas maintained, managed with fire, uh, you know, they're monitoring for invasive species, right? They're doing a lot of work and they don't get a lot of thanks for it. So uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to a commissioner or any of the folks out there working on these parks, you know, tell them what a great job and how proud you are that you live in a county that, you know, has all these opportunities to go see, you know, nature um, and these really diverse ecosystems. Another great map is tra Trailahassee. So this is, again, this is another one of these maps uh, through the tlcgis.org website. This will tell you where you can get some of the, you know, maybe some longer trails, either paddling trails, mountain bike trails. Uh, there's even a, a motorcycle trail in the National Forest that looks kind of fun. Um, I think I, I I think I would hurt after a I've, I've watched those guys jump in the little hoopty doos things and I think it'd be sore the next day. Some additional resources you have field guides so FNA of course that FNA natural community guide. I had to put in this plug for the Audubon guide. I still have my Audubon guide that I got when I was probably still in college. Uh, it's great. It's got plants, animals, fish, shells. Uh, it's great. It's even got natural communities in there, I believe, and like where you can go see them. Uh, online apps, the USF Plant Atlas, uh, the Atlas of Florida Plants is a great place to go to get maps and pictures and links to various species. Uh, iNaturalist, hopefully you all know about iNaturalist. That is a way where if you're out in the woods and you got your phone, which you know, you're know you probably going to have your phone close by, you can uh, take a picture of a plant, an animal, a bird, if you can get it in the camera, and it will kind of give you a really good, usually it's right, it's pretty impressive how uh, correct iNaturalist is. Uh, the other cool thing about iNaturalist is there's an explore feature where if you're out in the woods and you're curious what other people have found, you can hit this explore button and it'll show you, you know, it'll kind of populate what other people have found and recorded in the area you're at. Uh, of course, uh, going out into these places is really the best way to learn. So these conservation related groups like Audubon, the Plant Society to do field trips. Uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't do a field trip with this one, but I did wanna tell you all at this point that the in April, the county's having their sustainability summit. And I think April the 8th, uh, it's the weekend right there around April the 8th, uh, I am gonna be doing a Kind of walking tour of a county um, natural area. I'm not really sure which one yet, but it might be St. Mark's, might be Fred George. I'm not sure which one I'll do, but we'll walk around and we'll talk about what we're seeing. Um, oh, one online thing I missed here, the, the map here on the lower right, this is a, a map with Florida Natural Areas Inventory. And 
the great thing about this map is if you click on any of these, um, if you click on these these polygons of, of natural areas, it actually gives you a list of natural communities that are there, um, rare plants or animals that are found. Um, so this is just a Florida conservation lands, uh, I think it's called the interactive Florida conservation lands map through FNA. And I will say for books, the IFAS extension bookstore uh, is a great spot to get some various field guides. So I know they have some of the Gil Nelson guides uh, and some other kind of native wildflowers, native trees type of stuff there. Okay, questions. Let's open up the questions. Dara, should I stop the, the share here for questions? And I hope, uh, I'm good to stick around for a little bit if, if need be. Well, sweet. Uh, you can stop the share and we can pull it okay. right back up right at the very end. So yes, questions. Please, everybody, if you have questions, direct them to the Q&A section so we can answer them. Um, First up, uh, I have I have a personal question because I was listening. Got, um, why aren't there creeks in Northeast Tallahassee? I think you said near Cat Circle. Or Southeast. So uh, what happens when you when you get down south of the scarp? Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, so it has a lot to do with how how this it's a lot of sands. So basically when you have a lot of that clay in the Red Hills, you get a lot more runoff, right? So you get lots of winding streams, but when you get down below the scarp, you have mostly sand and there is not much runoff. The, the water, when it rains, right? It just goes right through the soil. So instead of forming uh, above ground features, it all just kind of sinks down into the sand. So it's all about soil. I love soil. It's all about soil. Okay, I just wanted to knock it out before I forgot. Okay. Um, could you speak to fire suppression um, and or how could you speak more to how fire suppression shifts plant communities? Yes. Yeah, so fire suppression, you know, Smokey the Bear did a lot to encourage fire suppression. Right? There was this idea that fire was bad and we didn't want to do it. Uh, in Florida, there was also something I think when when laws were changed for um, fencing off of property. So there was a time when cattle could just roam and, you know, they could just kind of went all over and the cattlemen would actually burn large chunks for their cattle. But when they started fencing it off, they would only burn theirs. And so then if their neighbors didn't burn, you know, you would get fire suppression. And so what fire suppression does is it favors more woody species. Um, so you get a lot of oaks, especially. And Kind of like weedy type oak trees like laurel oaks water oaks um, lots of hardwoods uh, and woody plants kind of you know because they're not getting kind of pruned back by that fire they become the dominant um, or they be they become more and more dominant and then that starts changing the fuel loads right so the you think of an oak leaf versus a pine needle uh, you have much less ability then to carry fire through that so you know typically what will happen is you have a beautiful music flatwoods that has been fire suppressed what you tend to get to is more of a woody shrubby understory you start to lose that real diversity of the herbs you know the, it's the herbaceous layer that is you know really really diverse down there and so you start to lose that now the cool thing is you can bring it back and so when we did some of these historic natural community maps we would be walking through really thick uh, tai tai. Um, and if you've walked through the National Forest or if you've been through the National Forest, you've seen tai tai. Yeah, it's uh, one of the tai tais are blooming right now. And, um, but every now and again, we'd be walking through these really thick, you know, it was really terrible walking type of condition, but we would find little sprigs of wire grass in these little bitty openings. And so we would take data furiously, like, you know, here is where you'd want to try to come and get fire started and try to expand it back out. So in a fire suppressed area, hardwoods kind of encroach, but you know, if it's not too bad, you can kind of reintroduce fire or you go in there and you can, um, you know, sometimes folks will mulch it down. Sometimes we'll use herbicides to thin it out. Sometimes they'll girdle trees to kind of knock them back. And the, the one thing about fire is the timing is really important as well. So, um, mid you know like growing season burns are ideal uh, because what happens is the oaks have flushed all their leaves out and they've used all this energy from the root system to put out leaves again and then you kind of stress them out with a fire and so that really knocks them back a bit 
uh, if you burn during the dormant season when the oaks are kind of, you know, they're deciduous, they're hunkered down, they're kind of hibernating for the winter, you have much less of an effect on them. And so it's, um, you know, it's not as good as kind of thinning out some of those hardwood trees that have encroached. There's a long answer. What else you got there? Anybody there? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was muted. Oh, <laughs> if you had to send someone, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, um, from out of town to one Leon County natural area, which mm. one would it be? And also why? Oh, okay. I think in Leon County, I'd probably take them to Forest Meadows. Um, Forest Meadows over there off Miller Landing uh, in Meridian Road, right by the soccer fields. I kind of spend a lot of time, you know, I take the kids to soccer practice and sometimes I get time to walk. Uh, this would be a good time of year because it stays late or light late. But you get to see red oak woods and then you get down by these black water streams and you're kind of in this upland mixed forest or upland hardwood forest where you have giant beech trees. I love beech trees. There's giant magnolia trees. There's trilliums. There's huge cypress trees down there. There's tulip poplars, right? And that's down in the bottomlands. Then you can kind of come up into the red oak woods and there's just there's just as a botanist there's just really cool plants up in there and so that's where i'd take them okay sweet thank you um we have an out of towner uh and they would like to know if they're what kind of trees or foliage that is unique to their area specifically maryland and they're also, they also would like to know about the cicadas, the 17 year brood cicadas that will be coming up in spring. The, the, wait, they want me to tell them what is- uh, So two things, tree, so a, foliage. A, a unique foliage tree in Maryland? Yes. I'm not that good there. I'm a Florida guy. <laughs> <laughs> that good. And I'm a plant guy, so I really can't help you with cicadas either. But I, I do know about these cycles of cicadas, but I, I couldn't really tell you. We'll have to get entomologists on next time. All right, sweet. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you so how much are birds influencing plant diversity um, in mm. terms of spreading seedlings? Well, because of that reason, they're really, really important, you know. Um, yeah, they're, they're spreading the seed. There are, you know, these indicator species. We talked about indicator species as far as, you know, what kind of is the guide to what natural community you're in. Uh, but there are definitely birds that are specific. So you have your music flatwoods, especially in the national forest. Um, uh, you have your, you know, like RCWs are known to be, your red cockaded woodpeckers are known to like, that's their, they love that stuff. But as far as dispersing seeds, I mean, they're one of the main dispersal methods for a lot of our trees, in addition to some of our other animals. But, um, you know, they're a huge part of it. And I mean, unfortunately, sometimes they're part of the, the spreading the bad plants as well. So, um, I, you know, I, I had a ton more slides in here that I cut out because I wanted to make sure I was on time. But I will go over some of the invasive plants that you can find in some of these systems. And something like camphor tree, especially, uh, you will see the robins just devouring camphor trees in the winter. And unfortunately, they're flying, you know, over the national forest and, you know, dropping them as they go. So um, but you got you got to have them all right. It's the biotic and the abiotic. Um, most of the time it's for good. Right. And but sometimes they can actually be helping spread some of our, our bad seeds as well. Well, okay. Um, so just a few more questions because, you know, it's time to wrap up. Uh, okay. Do you have any, do you have any notion when the River Sink Trail might be open? One of our attendees is curious. Which one? The Leon Sinks? River Sink. River Sinks. I don't know. I know the Leon Sinks has been closed for, I think they're working on the the boardwalks over the spring there, or the sinks, the river sinks must, they must be talking about further down um, New Light Church Road and uh, Crawfordville. And I didn't know those were closed actually. I haven't been over there in a while. I don't know. That is owned by, I think that's managed by the Wakulla Springs Park. So that would be the folks to call over there. Okay. Um, and I, I guess that's a little, I guess that's done and you see okay. the last question in case you feel like being personal. 
shout out to the hometown? Uh, well, um, you know, uh, I love Tallahassee. You know, I'm not, I grew up in West Palm Beach and came here in 2003, Peter mentioned. And it's really amazing how, you know, right here in town, we have all this access to great, amazing um, ecosystems and nature is all around us. It's pretty cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there anything else? Is there anything that I or one of the attendees haven't asked you that maybe we should have? Hmm. Well, how can you incorporate more native plants into your landscape? How can we incorporate more native plants to our landscape? Well, try to find out what kind of, you know, in your yard, think of where your yard is and what physiographic region it's in. Maybe look around, you know, there might be little pockets of nature that are left in the neighborhood. You know, what are some of these indicator plants that you might see? And maybe you can start planting them in your yard and then you can go explore some other of these really, um, you know, really well intact systems and find out the little pretty flowers that you like and see if you can go get them at a local nursery that say specializes in native plants and see if you can add those to your to your yard. Well, thank you. That was great. That was a great suggestion. And I love the suggestion about local native nurseries too. Yes. So, yes. Well, I think that's all. Thank you so much, Mark, for your time. Um, we'll be sure to maybe visit you as soon as we can, as soon as things open up. Thank you for all our attendees for coming. Please come next month for our next month's presentation. And we hope you all have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.